The 9-11 truth movement is all about finding the truth of what happened on 9-11. It is not fundamentally about pointing a finger at the government or the CIA or the military or the military industrial complex, nor is it fundamentally about letting the accused Arab hijackers off the hook. The 9-11 truth movement is fundamentally about uncovering the evidence and following the evidence where it leads. The scientific core of the 9-11 truth movement has achieved a remarkable degree of consensus on the evidence that the twin towers of the World Trade Center were hit by large airplanes and that three buildings, the Twin Towers and Building 7, were brought down with some combination of pre-planted explosives and incendiaries. A lot of the early work on these issues was done by independent researchers such as Jim Hoffman, Stephen Jones, Kevin Ryan, and a large number of others. A lot of this early work was consolidated by architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. As with any scientific enterprise, there were a mixture of good and bad theories. Bad theories, in other words, theories that lacked evidence or fundamentally didn't make sense, got weeded out along the way. It's all part of the refining process. A problem with a broad movement is that people who are not accustomed to the back and forth of the scientific method get attached to their pet theories and don't want to let go. This leads to factions and infighting and distracts from the search for truth. Fortunately, with respect to the World Trade Center at least, there was a solid core of scientific leadership. Demolition theories became well-established and other theories such as no planes, missiles hidden in pods under the planes, real-time video fakery, and the use of mini-nukes and energy beams became marginalized by the scientific core of the movement. Finding the truth is a sifting process. Architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth adopted as a matter of policy to limit their attention to the World Trade Center. That made sense for them because they realized their primary expertise was in building structures. That focus is the primary reason we have as much consensus as we do on the issues surrounding the World Trade Center building destruction. Another reason for the focus is there is really no need to explain every corner of the 9-11 events. If it can be shown that there is insider complicity in the destruction of the World Trade Center, that means there is insider complicity at the Pentagon and whatever happened with the Flight 93 and the cover-up and the high-level coordination of the entire event because it was all one operation. A negative side effect of this policy, however, is it left the investigation of the Pentagon without the same level of scientific leadership as was brought to bear at the World Trade Center. Was the event at the Pentagon caused by a large plane, a small plane, a missile, internal explosions, or a flyover masked by a smoke cloud accompanied by staged evidence? Rather than undergoing a healthy winnowing process, people form fixed opinions about one element of the event or another. False narratives emerged based on weak or erroneous evidence that became belief systems. Anyone who challenged these beliefs was automatically suspect. There has been a virtual absence of healthy dialogue and an overabundance of name-calling. Jim Hoffman, one of the most prolific early independent researchers of 9-11, was widely derided for his evolving understanding of the Pentagon event. He, like many of the rest of us, initially thought the impacting object at the Pentagon was not a large plane. He even entertained the hypothesis of a flyover when the idea was originally proposed, but later rejected it for reasons he has spelled out clearly. He presented on his website very early on the fact that the damage to the Pentagon wall was not the 16 to 20 foot hole that was seen on a widely circulated early photograph. The broad first floor damage was obscured in that photo by fire hose spray. No single photograph shows the entire first floor opening clearly, but a composite of the available photography shows an opening 100 feet wide with a single bowed column remaining on the left and three badly damaged hanging columns toward the right. An apparent column in the middle of the second floor opening turns out to be another hanging column. Several members of Scientists for 9-11 Truth took on the challenge of understanding the Pentagon event. Unlike the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, 
who made it a policy to focus only on the World Trade Center. Scientists for 9-11 Truth has as its focus all aspects of the 9-11 event that can be studied scientifically. We don't engage with topics like the State Department's interactions with the hijackers or the insider trading on Wall Street based on 9-11 foreknowledge because that's outside our scope of inquiry. However, there is physical evidence at the Pentagon that can be studied. One member of scientists, the late Dr. Frank Legg, was very productive on Pentagon research. He, in conjunction with Warren Stutt, investigated the flight data recorder and found that the data in the last two frames was not properly translated by the standard commercial software. Once the error was identified and corrected, the FDR data brought the plane down to the correct altitude to enter the hole at the Pentagon. Frank noted that although there was data drift in the position of the plane due to cumulative measurement errors, the direction of motion was precise. Sliding the path of the plane laterally to align it with the entrance hole put it in alignment with both the internal and external damage and the radar path. This gives us a good degree of confidence that the FDR data was authentic. It was this alignment that got me off the fence in recognizing the significance of the FDR data. Frank analyzed the claims by Pilots for 9-11 Truth that in order for the plane to level out from its dive as it approached the Pentagon, it would be subjected to an upward g-force of 10.14 g's. He found that this calculation was very much in error. The actual g-force would be anywhere from less than 2 g's up to about 3 g's, depending on your assumptions. Several years after Frank had done his calculations, I did the calculation myself two different ways and got results that agreed with Frank's. Despite our approaching pilots about the error, they refused to take their erroneous results off their website. I mention this to illustrate the lack of dialogue in the Pentagon research arena. I became involved with the Pentagon research when I joined Frank in a paper he was writing that analyzed the feasibility of the approach path of the plane advocated by a group that calls itself Citizen Investigation Team, or CIT. We jointly wrote two papers on this topic, demonstrating that their proposed path, which conflicts with the damage pattern, both inside and outside the Pentagon, not only requires the assumption that all the physical evidence had to have been faked, but the path they proposed was physically impossible. It would have required very high lateral g-forces and unrealistic banking angles that were not observed by any of the witnesses. Pentagon research by members of scientists continued, but it took a major turn when Wayne Costey undertook a systematic evaluation of the physical evidence. He was able to show in great detail how the damage to the Pentagon wall was consistent with a large plane and ruled out all of the other hypotheses that have been offered to date. Energized by his efforts, I and others have researched the affirmative implications of the physical evidence, culminating in a conference on the Pentagon evidence held in Denver in the spring of 2019. At that conference, Ken Jenkins talked about the psychological aspects of this inquiry. Wayne Costi and I talked about the physical evidence in and around the Pentagon. Warren Stutt presented his work on the FDR data and John Wyndham summarized all the major theories advanced so far and assessed how well each one matches the evidence. John's conclusion was that only large plane impact rises to the level of a viable scientific theory. All of the talks, by the way, are available on the Scientists for 9-11 Truth website. This was a remarkable event for those of us trying to put the Pentagon research on a scientific footing because it brought some of the key researchers together and we learned a lot from each other in the process. I would like to take the remainder of this video to explain my own research in the correlation between the FDR and the damage path, which grew out of the collaboration at the Denver conference. One of the most valuable researchers to have at the Denver conference was Warren Stutt, coming from New Zealand. He came a few days early and we spent much of the time digesting the detailed analysis he had performed on the raw FDR data file. I was interested to know if the FDR data took the plane all the way to the wall or if the last data point occurred just prior to impact. Warren was able to show the data went all the way to impact. The acceleration of the plane was forward as it approached the Pentagon, 
but the very last data point involved a maximum negative acceleration reading. In other words, we were seeing the effect of the impact itself. One of the big revelations, new information for Warren actually, was the photograph of the FDR as it lay in the rubble at the point of discovery. This photograph was included by Ken Jenkins in his presentation. What Warren immediately recognized that the rest of us had glossed over was that what we were seeing was not the complete FDR. It was only the memory module. This meant that the two parallel streams of data being written to memory were both terminated simultaneously and abruptly as the FDR was torn apart. This would be like pulling the memory stick out of your computer prematurely while it's still trying to write data. Warren realized this accounts for the exact nature of the data errors that were observed in the last two frames. The fact that the observed physical damage to the unit corresponds with the nature of the errors in the data in the last two frames is, if you think about it, evidence that supports the authenticity of the photograph and the data set itself. The data accords with the facts on the ground. I took it upon myself to try to understand in greater detail the alignment of the FDR data path with the physical path marked out by the light pole damage. The preliminary work on this issue was done by Frank Legg, who died in 2016. I was working with him and took his results as the basis for my understanding, but with Frank gone, I wanted to reconstruct his measurements so I would understand them in detail myself. Frank had pointed out to me that the path had to be adjusted for data drift. He had aligned the path with the entrance hole in the Pentagon and found that the plane represented in the data had flown through all of the light poles, hitting only the ones that were observed to have been hit and missing the others. When I attempted to reconstruct his transformation of the data, I recognized that the hole in the Pentagon being fairly broad did not locate the path precisely. I instead started by locating the right engine of the plane where it had gouged the top of a tree on the Highway 27 overpass of Columbia Pike. When I did that, I noticed that the right wingtip seemed to touch or nearly touch a pole holding a traffic camera that was monitoring traffic on Highway 27. It has long been known that there was a rung that is missing on that pole, and researchers have speculated that it was knocked off by the right wingtip of the incoming plane. Out of curiosity, I made the assumption that the right wingtip actually touched the pole to see if it would still hit all the other poles correctly. What I found was that, to the resolution of the Google Earth photograph I was using, the left wingtip either missed or barely hit the second light pole. I was discouraged by this finding, but when I mentioned it to Wayne Costi, he excitedly informed me that that resolved a puzzle about the second light pole. The pole was bent by the wingtip and knocked over, but not severed by the impact. That meant it had to have been grazed by the left wingtip. Once the path was shifted so the right wingtip touched the camera pole and the left wingtip barely touched the second light pole, the right engine went through the tree on the overpass at the right place. I then projected forward to the impact at the Pentagon. Just in front of the Pentagon wall was a generator trailer used for the Pentagon refurbishment project. It was hit by the right engine of the plane and the left engine gouged out a shallow oval notch in a low concrete retaining wall a few feet farther along. I found that if I used the placement of the plane, determined by my first three points of contact, and the direction of motion of the plane, given by the FDR, the right engine hit the generator trailer at exactly the right place, and the left engine was correctly placed to take out the notch in the retaining wall. In other words, using the FDR for direction of motion and locating a single point where the right wingtip touched the camera pole, we have five precise points of contact to within inches. The precision of this outcome has significance far beyond mere precision in a measurement that was previously known to fair precision. The measured wingspan exactly matches the wingspan of a 757, and the spacing of the engines exactly matches the engine spacing for a 757. And furthermore, this outcome confirms that the direction of motion given in the FDR data
precisely matches the motion of the incoming plane. If the direction of motion of the incoming plane were off by even a fraction of a degree, the alignment would not have matched. This detailed alignment of the FDR data with the points of contact on the ground is extremely strong internal evidence that the FDR data is authentic. There comes a point when the match between the data and reality is so precise that hand-waving claims that the data could have been faked are no longer believable. We have a very strong case here that the FDR contains an authentic record of the flight of the plane that hit the Pentagon. The significance of this finding goes even further. If the FDR data is recognized as the actual data for the incoming plane, then the entire flight path shown in the FDR data from Dulles International Airport to the Pentagon must also be seen as credible. That data gives us a continuous flight path that agrees with the radar path and rules out speculation of a plane swap along the way. That means the passengers who got on the plane at Dulles actually died in the Pentagon, and skeptics have less reason to doubt the authenticity of the extensive DNA database compiled in the weeks and months following 9-11. Even without the FDR, we have ample reason to believe a large plane consistent with a 757 hit the Pentagon. Look through Wayne Costey's presentation of the evidence at 911speakout.org for evidence of the size of the hole, signs of direct external impact damage, the presence of plane parts unique to a 757, and much more. Look at the direct visual evidence of the plane approaching the Pentagon elsewhere on that site. John Wyndham's conclusion that large plane impact was the only explanation that rises to the level of a scientific theory relies on evidence other than the flight data recorder. The physical damage, coupled with the radar data and the FDR data in general, led him to conclude that the large plane was a Boeing 757, and most likely AA-77 itself. What the recent detailed work on the FDR adds to the picture is the actual identification of the large impacting plane as American Airlines Flight 77. We still have to wonder who was controlling the plane. Was the flight path feasible for the presumed hijacker pilot to have flown? Were the hijackers themselves electronically hijacked? These are only a few of the loose ends. But recognizing that there really was a large plane impact and that the evidence points to the actual AA Flight 77 clears the way for ongoing research. It is just as important that the 9-11 Truth Movement nail down the evidence that challenges our own long-held beliefs as it is to reveal government lies and cover-up. For our work to stand up to scrutiny, it's important that it be rigorous and impartial. Focusing on the truth liberates us because it means we don't have to sell a point of view. The truth speaks for itself.